Uh, our next speaker is a guy named Darren Mackey. He's going to be coming up speaking about VXLAN routing and bridging. So this presentation is going to complement Ron's presentation, but we're going to zoom out a little bit. Uh, so Ron kind of covered the um, VMware aspect of things and the software vSwitch side. Uh, I'm going to look at the larger architectures that you might look at in a uh, VXLAN infrastructure. If you could get a little closer to the mic. Okay. okay. All right, so it didn't look like too many people were running VXLAN in production. Uh, who would say they're familiar with VXLAN? Okay, many more people. Good. Um, so I won't uh, belabor the, uh, the details too much. Uh, so within VXLAN, it's of course a layer two over layer three tunneling protocol. And uh, there are a couple major components. Uh, the VTEP is the main one I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, the VTEP, the VLAN tunnel endpoint, or the virtual tunnel endpoint, does all the heavy lifting in VXLAN. It's going to do the encapsulation, and it's going to do the decap when traffic comes back from layer three. Uh, we also have the VTI, which is going to be the source address for frames that are getting encapsulated. And uh, the VNI, which is the actual VXLAN network, the virtual network. So in a basic v VXLAN um, setup, you have uh, two VTEPs, and we have two hosts that are in the same subnet. You've got VTEP A and VTEP B. Traffic that is sourced from this bare metal server over here will hit VTEP A. It'll get encapsulated uh, by the VTEP, go across the layer three domain, and then hit VTEP B. In this case, VTEP B is a software VTEP. This could be living in VMware, this could be another hardware switch, um, whatever. Something is doing a decapsulation there and then the traffic goes to the virtual server. From the perspective of this virtual server and the bare metal server, they're on the same, um, same virtual network. They might as well be on the same switch in the same VLAN. Um, in terms of the frame for format, uh, this was already covered a bit. One thing I want to point out here is that uh, in the UT UDP fields, um, in the UT UDP portion of the header, uh, intentionally, the, uh, there's a, the source port is included and is random. The point of that is to include entropy for equal cost <coughs> multipath. If you have all of these VXLAN networks floating around your layer three domain um, and you're using equal cost multipath, which you should to use as much bandwidth as possible, then uh, you need some entropy in this traffic in order to get as much load balancing as possible. Uh, I'm going to gloss over some of the control plane aspects of VXLAN. That's not too important from the bridging and routing topology perspective. Uh, but it is important to know that there is a control plane for VXLAN. Each VTEP needs to know where MAC addresses live um, in other VTEPs, so it knows where to send those encapsulated frames. Uh, typically, this is through multicast in the Layer 3 network, although there are ways to do it uh, via unicast. Um, Arista also has a uh, centralized service that does some of that um, uh, coordination. All right, so if you read about VXLAN, you've probably focused on VXLAN bridging. VXLAN bridging is the, the typical use case. In VXLAN bridging, you have a host um, sending traffic, uh, two hosts on two different VTEPs, uh, just as we just described, uh, going through the same subnet, getting encapsulated in one, decapped on the other. They look like they're in the same layer two domain, and that's it. Very simple. Uh, but there's also VXLAN routing. As this scales, you have to think about where you do routing. As an encapsulated protocol, you have a bunch of options. You're going to be rout routing the encapsulated frame, that outer frame. Uh, you're, going to be, you're going to be routing the inner frame as well. And you may want to do both depending on the situation, depending on the architecture. Uh, so a basic VXLAN routing setup is, uh, is shown here. So the right side of this picture, uh, going from VTEP.2 to VTEP.1, is exactly bridging, as we described. Uh, this is all over VNI 2000 or over um, VLAN uh, 20. Now, what happens if you have a host in another VLAN and you want it to hit um, this host over here on this far VTEP? Well, this VTEP's default gateway actually lives over there in uh, .1. And so what ends up happening is you've got um, traffic coming from host A, going to .1, going to its gateway locally on VLAN 10, it gets routed, and then once it's in VLAN 20, it gets encapsulated and VXLAN bridged over to um, the VTEP.2, and then it gets decapped and sent to the host. And of course, this works in the reverse manner too. You have uh, traffic coming from um, host B, that's gonna get encapsulated, VXLAN bridged, then decapped, then routed, and then sent over to uh, the host on VLAN 10. 
But that's not complicated enough. What if the default gateway within uh, both VXLANs are remote? In that scenario, uh, if we have traffic coming from host B going to host C, well, that's going to get encapsulated. It'll go across uh, VNI 2000. It'll hit the center VTAP. It'll get decapped. It'll get routed. It'll get end-capped. And then you'll, it'll get sent over to uh, host C. So those four methods are, are are the only ways that you can do bridging and routing in VXLAN. They're pretty straightforward. Uh, but you'll see when you combine them in larger topologies, it gets pretty complicated. And there are a lot of trade-offs in the, in the uh, design. So we're going to look at uh, three different use cases for VXLAN. And after that, I'm going to run through uh, different options for uh, designing those, those network architectures. Each of them are going to have uh, trade-offs. So first is the, um, the public cloud or the hosting provider. The main requirement in the public cloud or hosting provider is to uh, support lots of tenants. And those tenants need to be uh, segregated from each other. Um, they should, they, a given tenant shouldn't know anything about any other tenant. And ideally, the, we want the underlay to um, be completely oblivious to what tenants are doing. So a particular tenant couldn't, say, inject tons and tons of routes into their uh, routing tables and then blow up the provider network. That would be bad. Uh, so typically, we're going to uh, lean on VXLAN bridging. And uh, for things like VRF support, we'll offload those to a uh, normal routing platform. Uh, the other scenario we're going to look at is a simple data center interconnect. Within the data center inter interconnect category, there are kind of two subcategories. The most common is connecting two geographically dispersed data centers. So uh, if you have two or three or 10 data centers and you want to um, either bridge tenants or just bridge VLANs because you have legacy applications, uh, you can do that with VXLAN simply by putting uh, VTEPs on the edges. The other use case is within a, a pod-based data center. Um, if you have different pods in the data center and there are certain applications that need to look like they're layer two adjacent or you just need to do this to keep your tenants happy, uh, that's another option for, uh, for a DCI. And then the third option is the enterprise cloud. Uh, this has a lot in common with the uh, public cloud, but some of the restrictions are relaxed. Um, you probably don't have to deal with overlapping IP address ranges, so VRFs are not going to be quite as important here. Um, and we may not care so much that the underlay and the overlay are completely separate in all cases. Uh, this is going to give us a lot more flexibility in uh, the topology design. All right. So <clears throat> From there, we can jump into different ways to do the routing within VXLAN. Uh, the most basic approach is centralized routing. Uh, centralized routing works great in a public cloud environment. could also work in an enterprise uh, cloud environment. Um, and the way this works, you have the VXLAN fabric in the middle. It's all VXLAN bridging in the middle. We've got um, each of the VTEPs. This is pure bridging, pure bridging up here. So all of the traffic uh, originating from a given customer, a given tenant, is going to go to uh, first its top of rack VTEP. It's going to get encapsulated. It'll go through the VXLAN fabric in the middle. It'll hit your edge node. It'll get decapped. And then go over a dot one Q trunk to the core. Uh, the core is going to be a typical routing platform. Um, it can handle as many VRFs as you want, or you could split it up so you have multiple instances of cores for different sets of customers depending on their requirements. Uh, the big advantage here is, one, the spine is completely uh, oblivious to what's happening in each of the uh, customer's routing uh, tables. And um, you have a lot of control over what happens with the routing on the core side. Uh, the disadvantage, though, is the, the routing path is this huge trombone. So if a, um, if one tenant is on one rack and he needs to hit another tenant in the same rack, uh, that traffic is not going to get switched or bridged on that single VTEP. It's, they're going through the same piece of hardware. It's actually going to go all the way up to uh, the core, get routed, and then all the way back down, uh, which is certainly not ideal. Uh, north to south traffic, though, is pretty much optimal. Um, it's going directly from the core anyway. It'll get encapsulated and then go down to a particular VTEP. Um, yeah, so I covered the pros and cons there. Uh, this is actually pretty common in production networks. Uh, that tromboning effect 
depending on the traffic pattern, isn't as common as you might think. And the ability to very precisely handle a routing um, is, is a major benefit in many, um, many environments. So what if, we, what if we do more routing in more places? Uh, one optimization is to route on all of the VTEPs. In this scenario, all of the top of rack switches, uh, all of the VTEPs, have SVIs in all of the networks. So traffic that uh, originates here, if it's going from, say, blue to green, can get routed directly at that VTEP. Uh, there's no more of that massive tromboning effect. Uh, traffic that is going north to south works, uh, works just as it did in the, in the other scenario. So this, at a first glance, seems pretty optimal. Uh, we have direct routing. Um, all the traffic from a given VTEP is going to follow the optimal routing path. And uh, north to south looks good, too. Uh, but the problem here is you very quickly run out of IP addresses in a large network. If you're talking about a dozen VTAPs, a couple dozen VTAPs, this is a great design, and it works really well. Uh, but think about the scenario where you have 200 VTAPs, and you're running slash 24s. Well, you have room for about 50 actual hosts now in each uh, VXLAN, um, which isn't ideal. You could certainly use larger subnets, but um, this seems to point to maybe there's a better way of doing this. Uh, there are also some issues if you try to share IP addresses. So that's another approach. You try to share IP addresses, gateway addresses, uh, then you run into some weirdness if you try to connect to anything from a switch or you try to connect to a particular switch. Uh, nevertheless, if it's a smaller environment, this still works well, uh, particularly in the enterprise cloud ca uh, case. And I'm skipping a lot of slides for uh, time, but feel free to download these. Um, it goes through all the different uh, traffic scenarios. Uh, so another con in this design is that the, the size of the entire VXLAN deployment is limited by the uh, least capable device in the network. So if the VTEP can only handle um, 16,000 MAC addresses, that's the limit of the entire VXLAN network because that has to be distributed across uh, all, of the, all devices. Now, an obvious optimization there is to not do everything everywhere. Uh, be a little bit smarter about that. So uh, another approach is indirect routing. With indirect routing, we, uh, we don't route everything everywhere. Maybe I have 10% um, or 20% of the SVIs on a given uh, set of VTEPs. And if I'm in the enterprise space and I have some control over where my applications live and what physical racks, I can make a pretty smart decision uh, over um, which racks should be routing which SVIs. Um, so we'll add a couple things compared to the, uh, the direct routing case. Here we add uh, a shared VNI. The shared VNI is going to run an IGP to uh, share routing information among VTEPs. So for traffic that does get routed at a VTEP, it knows uh, where to find other VTEPs. Um, that is also how we're going to handle default routes going out of the VXLAN network. So in this case, we've got, uh, this is sort of the general uh, north to south uh, traffic here. Uh, going, traffic coming in to the VXLAN network is going to uh, go to that shared VNI and that shared VNI lives on all the VTEPs, and so it'll get bridged to the VTEP, uh, decapped, and then routed. Uh, traffic going the other way uh, operates in exactly the opposite. Uh, east to west traffic, though, in the ideal case, operates just as in direct routing. Uh, traffic hits the VTEP, it gets decapped, uh, gets routed, and capped, done. But the worst case scenario in um, indirect routing is pretty bad. Uh, the worst case scenario in indirect routing is you have a host that hits a, a VTEP that doesn't have an SVI for it. That has to go to the spine. And then from that spine, it goes to a routed VTEP, from the routed VTEP back to the spine, and then to the destination VTEP. That's obviously not ideal and uh, requires multiple spine hops. So that's the major uh, disadvantage of the indirect routing strategy. But again, for an enterprise network, if you can uh, segregate the types of applications in a given rack. So you have storage racks or you have um, uh, you know, ERP racks or whatever. And you make sure that those uh, VTAPs all route those application subnets. Uh, that's no longer a major problem. OK. 
Okay. And then, uh, so another approach, uh, and this is mainly applicable on the enterprise side, is uh, naked routing. So naked routing, we have uh, another, I guess you could call it an optimization. Uh, removing some of the segregation from the overlay and the underlay gives you the ability to uh, simplify the network design and simplify the network adjacencies greatly. Uh, so on the previous design, you needed network adjacencies between all of the VTEPs that were doing routing. Um, in this case, you could have only adjacencies to the spines that you're already connected to anyway, and that you already have adjacencies to anyway because you're running VXLAN. Um, you're routing to all the VTEPs, so those adjacencies exist uh, to begin with. So in the naked routing scenario, um, we still have our VTEPs here, but we advertise um, a subset of the SVIs into, um, into the spine directly. So now, routing can occur uh, within blue and green VNIs across the board. Um, <clears throat> there's no longer the need to decap a hit of VTEP that has an SVI, end cap, and uh, then send it to the destination. In this scenario, uh, for instance, if I'm going from uh, blue to green here, uh, well, from here, I just, I'm just going to decap uh, I don't even end cap, so this is really just VLAN traffic hitting the VTAP. It gets routed through the spine like any other traffic, and uh, it'll hit the, uh, the green traffic on uh, the VTAP to the left. So a much more straightforward uh, routing path, much more straightforward routing protocol. Um, <clears throat> the big disadvantage is that the overlay and the underlay now are combined. So I, I lost that, uh, I lost that uh, separation. The, uh, the, other, uh, the other disadvantage to this is you don't have any, you have very little control over routing um, as in, say, the centralized case. So um, kind of coming full circle back to centralized routing, this is sort of the opposite of centralized routing. Here we have routing distributed across everything. Uh, the spine knows about all of the tenant networks. Um, all of the, the VTEPs or a subset of the VTEPs know about these spine networks. It's distributed across the entire network. And so the scale of this VXLAN is also going to be limited to uh, whichever device in the network has the smallest, um, the smallest table sizes. Uh, com contrast this with centralized routing where the entire, um, entire VXLAN fabric is completely immune, doesn't care about how big anything is. Uh, other than uh, MAC tables on the VTEPs, and all of the, that routing logic is in one place, uh, simply directly in the um, uh, on the core side. All right, so that was the ultra mega fast uh, intro to VXLAN uh, routing and bridging. Any questions? Now it's your time. <laughs> Okay. <laughs>